Hi, Karen. Good morning. Good morning, Felice. I'm actually going to call you now, okay? Hey, Mina. Hi, Galit. Good Hi. to see you. I was so, so disappointed that you can't stay, like seriously. Yeah. I'm, I'm also so disappointed. I tried yeah. to do whatever I could, but it's... Uh, it really sucks. It's a problematic place with problematic times. I know, uh, I, know I know. Just that you check that I have my... 
presentation here. Yes. Good. Yeah, we have a bit of a um, snowstorm here. <gasps> we have talking. one of the hottest days. It's like 26 degrees. It's going to be uh, like. How I would like to be there. <laughs> how I would like to be there. <laughs> <laughs> this next, like... year, next year, we're going to switch. Next oh, year. Yes. Next year, I will not do anything else except be on, on a, hopping on the airplane on and off, no matter what the environmentalists say. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you get a vaccine already? No, 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 no. We are not like the Israelis. It's, we like have like less than zero percent, no, less than one percent of people vaccinated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was lucky uh, somehow. Uh, that Have you been vaccinated? Well, I tried once. I was rejected. You're not old enough. I tried again. Rejected. You're not old enough. I tried the third time. Boof. It says, OK, when would you like to come to be vaccinated? Oh, I'm so envious. I'm so yeah, envious. Yeah. You know, you have to understand the logic of these uh, apps and the AI behind and the, yeah. the algorithms. Like, you have to over and over again. And one day, yeah. all of a sudden, it it just, you know, it gives up and says, okay, you know what, take the vaccine, I'm, <laughs> I've had enough with you. Enough vulnerability features for the machine to appreciate you. <laughs> Is my, um, can you hear me okay? Is this uh, good? Yeah, for the... yeah, I hear you perfectly okay. fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I'm so excited. It's, it's going to be really super. It's, it's such an updated topic. Um, yeah. We'll see. I try to make it accessible. So, um, yeah. yeah, it will be okay, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, wow, we have lots of participants already. Wow, that's good, very yes, good. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll start uh, shortly in like three minutes. Okay, yeah. I'll yeah. Just close the door. Yeah. Is Shai here? Yes, Shai, you are on mute. I was on mute. Hi, good morning, everybody. Oh, hello. Good morning. Good to see you. Regards to Erela. Mute again. Um, okay, never mind. We, we'll start shortly. Um, I just wanted to see that we are all uh, we are all here. So, um, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people here at the audience, some of the names I know, and I'm really happy to see both people that I know and don't know. Um, today, it's not 10, let's give it one or two minutes, just to let a few uh, more. More time? Okay. Okay. Let's wait some more. Yeah. Good. Good. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming in. Um, I'm very excited to open the third meeting of the, of the third year colloquium of medicine and humanities. We are trying to bring the two worlds together 
uh, it's been the third year and I'm so thankful to Noam Shumron and Karen Avram who are my partners in this project. Uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing work with them um, to combine these two worlds that seems to be so separate. Uh, it's a huge project, but I'm very happy that we are managing to find all these interesting uh, cross sections between these two. Uh, and today we have uh, two prominent researchers that uh, Karen will introduce now. So Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Galit. And to Galit and Noam, thanks for really pushing us to keep this series going. I think we're in our third year now and we're gonna keep going. Okay, so it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Ben Shachal. He, I'll give you a little background about him. He completed his undergraduate training at the Sackler Faculty, so near and dear to our heart. And then he went on to complete his residency in pediatrics at the Tel Aviv Sarovsky Medical Center, then flew to Baylor to Texas uh, and clinical genetics residency at the Baylor College of Medicine. He was also a postdoctoral fellow uh, as well as uh, he did his residency. His doctoral training was in the field of mouse model syndrome and autism spectrum disorder. <laughs> She's a very prominent researcher uh, in, in Texas. She just uh, about a year or two ago won the Breakthrough Prize, um, as well as many others. So I'm sure that that was a really outstanding fellowship. Dr. Ben Shachel is now the Director of Precision Medicine and Genomics at Quilit Research Institute and Quilit Healthcare. He's in charge of Quilit's Emerging Biobank and its next generation sequencing activities as well as Clalit's clinical genetic policy. He's also an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the Sackler Faculty of Medicine. And so we're gonna hear from him today. Please, very much looking forward to it. And I just wanna remind the speakers, we're gonna, each speaker will have 30 minutes and then we're gonna have the question and answer discussion that'll be moderated by Noam. Hi, good morning. I'm about to share my screen, so. Okay, so uh, do, do you see my screen? Okay, great. So good morning, everybody, everyone. It's a pleasure and privilege uh, to me to present uh, to you today this topic, realizing the potential of using data to improve care. Uh, as uh, Karen said, I'm the director of the Precision Medicine and Genomics at Clalit. Uh, and we are a group of clinicians and scientists uh, that try to take the data-driven uh, insight from bench, bench to bedside and uh, to integrate it in the system as quickly as we can. And uh, Precision Medicine is based on genomic and genomics is really the new child uh, at the block and nowadays biobanks and population genetics are very popular uh, everywhere, but we should remember that all of this part is, a, all of this is part of a complete effort associated with information. And this effort has been started many, many years ago, even before genomics was a part of it. And on my very personal perspective, those two worlds looks very different, but for me they are very, very similar because my spouse, she actually, she, she did a, her, her PhD at the STF, a Science Technology Society at bar Ilan University. So while every morning I deal with uh, medicine and with science, when I go to sleep or to bed every night, there is someone telling me, you know, scientific facts always only, only stays true for about 20 years. And after 20 years, we know that they are not really uh, facts. So, Having this in mind and having this notion every evening, I generate the talk to be relevant for both uh, words from the beginning. And the talk has uh, five uh, parts. The introduction, the talk about the AI, but more of the, the lack of acceptance of AI, then using AI and data in medicine. And then I will talk a, bit, a, bit, a little bit about polygenic risk scores as an example, and then I will conclude. 
and I will uh, I, I will stay on time, so this should be okay. Uh, as we know, why medicine is such an advanced field, there are many problems related uh, to medicine. We know that about 45% of the necessary interve intervention are missed on the daily life related to medicine. We know that uh, medical errors are the third more common cause for death. And we know that 30% of our care is full time with no any value added. And actually, being at the corona era, we, we can see it very, very simply, and we can see many examples. One of them is that the fact that in Israel, during the first lockdown, there was 20% reduction in the mortality rate. It was not only related to road accidents and shutting, it, it was just related to the fact that we, the physicians, we, we perform less operations, we saw less patients, we provide less care, and when we did so, we prevent some uh, death. However, during the COVID-19 era, we could see other things. We could see the vaccination uh, invention and effort, which is unbelievable. Nobody would ever believe to have uh, apparently uh, effective vaccination for a drug in such a, a short period. But at the exact same time, you can think how long it took us, and we are still don't know, to know, do, do we need to have masks every day? Do we know how to prevent the disease? Do you know if uh, you can get infected by to COVID by food, by people, by talking? So you can see from one side how effective medicine is, but from the other aspect, you can see how primitive and not effective we are as a scientific uh, scientist and uh, medical staff trying to deal with this emerging uh, pandemic. And thinking about that, we really know that we are not good in some fields. So we are, imagine that we are in a car, getting to one day in one direction, and we know that we've got so many problems to deal with that we don't know how to, how to, tack, how to tackle. And all we need to do is to say, is there any other way? Could we find a side way and uh, prevent this, uh, this future? And this is what we are trying to do, adding big data and AI. So big data, beside of the fact that it is data, it's a field. And it's, it is a field that analyzes information and data, which is big. This is a definition, which is too big uh, to be uh, dealt with the traditional uh, data setting. And actually someone told me many years ago, and probably he was right, he said to me, whatever you can put on Excel spreadsheet is big data. So whenever you can still use Excel, it's okay. Whenever Excel is not enough, then we talk about big data. And the other uh, term that we should use altogether is artificial intelligence. This is a problem, of course, because I just cleared for my wife that we don't know what intelligence is. So keep, keeping this first part aside, what we can say about AI, that artificial intelligence not like the natural one, it's something that is uh, demonstrated by machines. And people really don't like big data and don't like uh, and don't like uh, and don't like uh, AI. And there are many reasons for that. And one of them is just the human nature. You know, we use, especially in, in uh, science and medicine, to have an idea, to have a hypothesis, to check it, to go stepwise, and then to, to solve it. But when we deal with big data that look in an unbiased way, we don't know how the machine works. There is no one step belongs to other step. And then we got the conclusions and the predictions, but we cannot really talk, uh, understand how, how did mach the machine got to those uh, findings. And actually this makes us uh, trying to do what we always try, and this is uh, doing the unblack boxing. So you say there is a black box, you don't know how it works, we will try to understand it. But when we try to understand how it works, we, we, we don't think like the machine. We just make an imitation of an artificial process that we do ourselves 
It's like that we see our, our dog and he is very happy to see us. And we, and we say, oh, of course, we haven't been at home for a long time, but we really don't know how dogs think. And we don't know how machine thinks, but this is very uneasy for us to deal with this way of thinking. And the other problem is that the, if we don't, cannot follow the way that the machine gets to the conclusion, we cannot have good enough control and criticism about the process. And I will just give you one very famous example that maybe some of you know. And the, this is not related to medicine. It is related to the fact that many times dogs and wolves look very, uh, look very similar. However, while you can see this very nice uh, dog with uh, is a owner, we really don't like uh, wolves in some occasions. And there was an idea. Can I just make a AI helping us to, to know when I see a picture of a wolf and or when of a dog? And the way that you do AI is very simple. You first train the system, so you, you tell it, this is dog, this is wolf, this is wolf, this is dog. And then after you do, you do this training, you do the validation, and then you can use it. And actually, when people did it, it was amazingly good, except for a few examples. This is one example. When it didn't work, and this is another example, and the system didn't work. It didn't detect uh, the left or the right dog as dogs. They have been treated as, as a wolf. And when they tried, tried to understand what made this problem, they found that this was a very simple one. All of the pictures that was taken of dogs were taken on a very green, nice, or only like a background. However, whenever they took the wolf uh, picture, there was always snowing like the snow that uh, we know that there is now in North Europe. And in su such a situation, the computer didn't really look at the face and the nose and the eyes of the dogs or the wolves. It found something way easier to, to rely on. And this was the background. So whenever you put a dog on the wrong background or a wolf on the wrong background, the system came to uh, the wrong conclusions. And of course, people can say, okay, this show, our AI is the bad uh, thing, how stupid mistakes can be made. But if we think about it, the reason for the mistakes was us, was the training. Whenever we provided the training, we provided green uh, background for the dogs and the snowy one for the wolves. And knowing that, I, I would like to go to the next part and to talk about the using of big data and AI in medicine. And in medicine, we really, when we try to improve care and quality and value, there are two trends which are conflicting. One of them is a standardization. Standardization, why it sounds first as a bad word, you know, why you want to stand out, it so, sounds like bureaucracy. It is a really important one, because when you do standardization, you really can provide the best care. You can see the examples now of the vaccinations. If we say, we take everyone uh, older than 60 and va vaccinate uh, him or her, we can do it very fast and very efficiently without getting to too many questions that we cannot answer. You can think about the guidelines that we use all the time in, a, in cancer treatment. And then you say, we've got this cancer or the other cancer. Those are the guidelines. And you know that the same pa that the patient whenever he is in Finland or in Tel Aviv or in the United States, gets the best treatment, and there is no one physician make, uh, making his or her own uh, decision just based on a feeling or a subjective data. However, at the same time, there is another part. And the another part is the precision or the personalization. You say at the same time, why should we look at everyone as a standard? Shouldn't we just find the best treatment for a single person that will be just the perfect one for the specific problem that combine the medical problem, the background, the environment, and then you really can tailor the best treatment to the one patient. And big data actually uh, deals with both. It helps for standardization and it helps for personalization. And doing that, we must mention why do we have big data? How comes that in Klalit or in Israel, uh, HMOs, there is such a, a big data in the, uh, those integrated uh, sick funds? And first of, uh, of all, they are very old, okay? So not getting into politics uh, questions, okay? Those HMOs did not establish when the vaccination has been started, okay? So in Klalit, we say 100 years, but actually it is much more than that now. Uh, 
more than 50% of the Israeli population is a part of our uh, SIG fund and most uh, it's over representation of a uh, low social economic uh, status groups, minorities, elderly. We've got about 1600 clinics. We've got 14 hospitals. We've got hundreds of laboratories, pharmacies, uh, well, just name it. And uh, we're doing a lot of uh, telecare. And with those so many patients, we have digitalization for over 20 years. So we got all of the data in our digital records for such a long time. It really sounds like, you know, like a unbelievable, like Alice in Wonderland, you say, you say you've got so much data, but we all should remember that this data is digital, digital data, but it was not made or generated for researchers. It was generated for physicians that just wrote their notes. And many times it's very difficult to find, you know, what, what really happens in the situation. You know, as a physician, I know that too many times I wrote for my patients observation, which mean, means nothing. And, uh, and what we are doing at Clarit, we are trying to gather the data from any and every source we can. So we've got all of the hospitalization data of the patients. We know what was the cause in the hospital and what was the discharge data. And then we've got all of the primary care clinics and the specialty care clinics. And from all of them, we've got data, but we've got another data. We have a lot of administration. How much they pay, what they, do, what they did. We know about the pharmacy and think about it. You can say, you can think that there is a physician, he prescribed a medication for a patient, but the patient never took it. So did this patient really use those, let's say, uh, if you think about asthma, so, you know, you need all of those in health, but if the patient never used them, so it really, it didn't affect the treatment. So we really cannot follow, you know, did the patient put the pill in his mouth, but we can know, did he buy the medication? Did he buy it more than once? And if you see a patient and he time, time and again buy the same medication, you may realize that it makes sense that he really used it and not only bought it once and didn't use it. And we've got other data. We've got imaging and diagnostic. We even have got dental information and many other uh, sources of data. We've got mental health data. We've got uh, a live health service. We've got laboratory, of course. And we've got governmental data of what we call the, from the National Health, uh, uh, National Insurance Service. And there is a lot of national registries. And we really combine data from everywhere because the idea is that like the wolves and the dogs, that if you use one resource, you are prone to mistakes. So if there is a patient and the physician wrote a diagnosis of asthma, I cannot be rely on it. But if I see that the patient has got diagnosed of asthma, and then he got another diagnosis of asthma, and then he got prescription of uh, asthma-related medications, and then, and then I see that he took those medications, and then I see that he went to hospital once. In the hospital, the physician saw that he has got bronchitis or asthma, or asthma-related uh, pneumonia, so then I can be sure that the patient had asthma. And the gathering of such data is one of the ways to prevent the mistakes that could happen from a use of data. And when we talk about using big data in, in the eye in medicine, there are two main uh, topics. One of them is the prediction one and one of them is the precision one. I won't talk about the prediction, it's not my field, but I will just mention one example to understand how this field goes. So we have got many patients with what we call chronic kidney or renal disease. Those patients have abnormal renal function. Most of them will not have any problems. They may need some you know, low salt diet, some medications, but some of them will need after a few years to get and get dialysis, which is a big issue with a lot of mortality just by having the dialysis. And we were thinking, could we use AI to predict which of those patients are going to have dialysis. And the idea is simple. You take the machine, you provide, you feed it with all of the data you, that you've got, and you, tell, and you tell the machine, those patients with chronic uh, kidney disease uh, deteriorated and ne needed dialysis after a few years, 
and those didn't. And the machines look at all of the parameters and try to find those parameters that can predict which patient will need dialysis and which will not. And the moment the machines knew that, it's very, very accurate. You can see that you can just take the population and uh, make uh, beans based on the risk. And when you think that, and when the machine detected high risk for such situation, for the need of the dialysis, it's really very much reliable. And this really changed the way that we do medicine. Not only because we know to tell which patient that he should be more careful, more careful with the diet, that we should be much more aggressive with the treatments. I don't know if many in this audience know, but you know for renal disease, you can do a renal transplant. The problem is that if you do renal transplant after dialysis, the prognosis is not as good as you, if, if you do it without a dialysis, a story of dialysis for the same patient. So if you know which patient is supposed to have dialysis in the future, you really can tell not only when you should be more aggressive, but when you should look for renal transplant and find the donor ahead of time. So in, if, and when the patient will need it, you will be able to provide it on time. And the other part that we use data is for the uh, precision medicine. And the idea is to provide the right care to the right patient at the right time. And when we talk about uh, uh, precision medicine, we no, uh, not only talk about the data from the patient, about the electronic medical records and the monitors and the imaging, as we mentioned before, we talk, we talk about genetics. Uh, actually, there are many kinds of omics. You know, it's very fresh now to say genetics, genomics, uh, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, and so on. But actually, the most advanced part of omics now is in genetics. And the thing that made it so much available is this very nice and uh, very known graph about how much it costs uh, to a uh, sequence patient. And the price uh, uh, of the sequencing dropped so dramatically that it's unbelievable. Now, when you sequence patients, the most expenses related to administrations, to the working, but not, not to the real lab work. And when you've got it, you can add omics data to all of the previous uh, data that you've got, and you really can make uh, miracles. And the idea is that, of course, as we know, it's, each genome is different, is unique for the patient. And when you are doing so, and when you look at the genetic profile of everyone, you really find another way to say, those patients are in one group, the other are in a different group, and you really can uh, find the right persons for a specific treatment. You know which patient uh, may uh, benefit from the treatment and which will less or not. And this is all idea. The idea is that still today, let's say we've got one of us have a, a disease, a viral, a bacterial disease, then the doctor provides us medication. Many times it's the, same it's the same medication, it's the same drug that this doctor uh, provides for this disease to all of the patients. Some patients will benefit very nicely, some will not benefit, some will have adverse effects, either if they benefit or don't. But actually the idea should be different. The idea should be that each of us has the influence of his own genome, of the environment, of other data, and actually if we could just find the exact medication, then we would provide better treatment with lesser chance for having adverse effect. And this is a classical uh, example of how do we want to see our medicine in the future. And I will just give an example uh, related to what we call polygenic risk score. It's a bit complicated, but not too much, so I think we'll be able to go through it uh, together. The uh, polygenic risk score that we call it PRS is based on what we call genome-wide association studies, GWAS. The idea of GWAS was very simple. We can take large populations, one with a given disease, and the other that do not have this disease, and just find many genetic markers that we call them SNPs, but it is not important. And then we see, can we find differences in those very many SNPs between the population with the disease 
and the population that doesn't have the disease. And this is how it looks. We looked at thousands and hundreds of, uh, of SNPs. Most of them were the same. There was no significant differences, sorry, between those uh, with the condition and those without the condition. But for some of them, you found, you found those, those differences. And then I said, okay, <clears throat> this is important because this specific base is, is more prevalent uh, for patients with a given disease compared to the normal population. And for many years, researchers put huge effort to understand what does it mean? Why this change of A to C in this position really caused a difference? And usually they found nothing. First of all, because there are, there are many, many changes like that. Whatever is above the line is significant. And it, it has a meaning. So probably each of them contribute only a little bit and you ca cannot by searching one of them to understand the whole picture. But later on, people came with another idea that really fits the idea of precision medicine. And the idea was, so we know about those markers that each of them provide risk or protection from a given disorder. Let's say there are 100 markers like that and each of them contribute very little. One of them, if you've got it, your chance is not one, it's 1.2. And the, if you've got the other one, your chance is 0 0.9 and so on. But what we can do, we can just sum all of those markers and provide to each of us a, a mark, a grade. And we say for mo most of us will be just average, but some of us just by chance is higher or lower risk to have the condition. And in such situation, if you look at those people with higher risk and lower risk, and you really look at the extremities, it is really makes a difference. Uh, and, look and, look, and look at this uh, graph at the right side of the, of the slide. So let's say that we look in what, what age people get 10% risk, let's say for breast cancer. We know what is the average. And because of this average, there is a policy. You know, there is a recommendation for a, a, every woman when she reaches 50 to have mammogram. And some say should we decrease it to 40, but it's, it's for everyone. But this, is, that, this doesn't stand true because the people, the women that are in high risk actually uh, hit the 10% risk for breast cancer, not at the age of 60, but at the age of 50. So should they get mammogram earlier? And from the other side of the plot, we've got those women with lower risk. And those women will, have, will reach 10% risk for having cancer only when they're 70. In this situation, actually, you wouldn't like them to start with mammogram at the age of 50. It's expensive, it's inconvenient, it's related to radiation. And this is another example that I will not jump into it, but the idea is that we really can take the whole population, stratify it based on the risk that we calculated based on those polygenic risk scores, and then we can really provide the right policy to everyone based on this risk. And actually we do it every day. So in the beginning of the pandemic of the COVID-19, what we did at Clalit, uh, we look at every, we calculated the risk for having complications of COVID-19. And each patient of us had his own risk. It was related to age, but not only to age, to BMI. Uh, to chronic disorders. And whenever there was a patient diagnosed with COVID-19, the, the medical staff that were sitting at our uh, headquarters, they found the information, the, the grade, the mark of this person. And they said, okay, this person had COVID and he's got the highest uh, risk. He, he or she needs to go to the hospital. Let's see and let's follow them in the best way we can. However, in this, if this patient is in the lowest risk, we can feel very comfortable that it will just sit at home and do nothing. So those certifications, they are based on big data, but they aim to provide uh, advice and treatment and policy in the single or a very small level group. And our dream is combine those two uh, parts of uh, AI in medicine. So we could combine the PRS data with, our, uh, with the other data with the medical history, with the medications, with the social economical status. And they say, could we take all of this data together and have even better and higher ability to generate a prediction and to 
make our uh, treatment more precise. So overall, uh, we know that uh, data-driven uh, knowledge provide an emerging powerful tool to promote medical care and health. We know that, those, that the use of multi-layer data uh, increase the precision and decrease the mistakes. And, based on, and our aim is really to provide a better treatment and follow-up and, and to provide a better decision-making using all of these new advantages that we didn't have before. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shai, that was really wonderful. Um, so we're, what we're going to be doing is Noam as moderator is going to ask the questions of both of you at the end of the second talk. Okay, Shai? Oh, so yeah, I know, of course. Yeah, so stick around. <laughs> Okay, so it's my real pleasure now to introduce Dr. Minna Ruckenstein, who's arrived here by what we call Zoom, we like to call Zoom Airlines now. And so let me tell you about Minna. She's an associate professor at the Consumer Society Research Center and the Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities at the University of Helsinki. Nice and cold place these days. She directs a research group that explores economic, social, emotional, and imaginary aspects of algorithm systems and processes of datification. Her recently funded projects focus on algorithmic culture and rehumanizing automated decision making. So, what the, the work that Minna has done for years actually has disciplinary underpinnings with a wide range from anthropology, science, and technology studies, economic sociology to consumer research and she's published widely in international journals. Prior to her academic work, she worked as a journalist and an independent consultant, and the professional experience that she gained at that time has contributed to the type of work that she's doing today. She's gonna to tell us today about a collaborative project called Citizen Mindscapes, and it's an interdisciplinary research consortium with company partnership. So Dr. Ruckenstein, Nina, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that we'll be able to make it up by not being able to get you here by plane. Yeah, yeah I would so much rather be there than here, but it is what it is. He's here today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'll just uh, share my slides, which are curiously from the middle. The second. Okay. So, um, in comparison to the previous um, speaker, uh, my stuff is very explorative. So, um, so bear with me if it if it feels too explorative. Um, it started as a as a as a. Um, I'd say that it wasn't like a serious venture to begin with, but then it became serious over the years. So here you see um, the original group of people who were a part of this. And in the middle, we have a CEO of a company that um, hosts an online conversational forum with um, a history of 20 years. So they had this huge data set that they had not done anything with, and then they decided to open it for research purposes. And our thinking was that if we come from different perspectives to that data set, we might actually be able to do something useful with it. The data is anonymous, so we didn't have any kind of uh, socio-demographic info about you know, who the people actually were who were participating in these anonymous conversations. Uh, the topics ranged more than 2,000 different areas, so it's a very, very... Um, diverse kind of uh, perspective to, to how uh, Finns talk about things. And it tends to be um, not high quality uh, discussions, but you know, uh, peer support for health topics, um, ranting about what's wrong with the society, etc. So uh, once we got this data dump, we had 70 million comments over the period of 15 years. And this forum is is visited by Finns. People don't necessarily write, but it is something that you know everybody knows about. 
So you could talk about um, um, if you're traveling, you could ask advice. If you you know you want to cut your dog's fingernails, you you or do dogs have fingers, nails, dogs nails? You can look for advice. Uh, in comparison to Reddit and 4chan, for instance, you know this is is we have a very longitudinal data. Somebody said it's the most longitudinal data set in the in the whole world. Um, so we started with that, and um, I was a bit skeptical. You know, what do you do with this kind of data, which is it's quite thin? It's just you know snippets and posts and whatever. And I started thinking that somehow we have to find ways to make this thin data thicker. And with that in mind, uh, we started thinking about building kind of user interfaces on top of the data so that people who don't have computational skills, including me, could uh, get like a, a, a quick overview of what is actually there. So we started collaborating with a Finnish company called Futurize. They had a, a, a fund for um, corporate social responsibility, and they gave us uh, two people to work with intensely for some months on this data set. And we took the health discussions apart. Why medications? My idea was that medication words would be easier to find from this data set because they're not Finnish language, so they, they kind of stand out. Uh, it turned out to be um, not so, because uh, people talk about medications with uh, vocabulary, which is not necessarily the medication vocabulary, but at least, you know, something to get started. So within this data set, we had 90 million comments over the period of 16 years, because this data set has been updated with the, with the aid of the company over the years. So now we've been working on this data set for um, about five years. Yeah, so. so then, um, then building this radar, it was a it was a very mixed method, and you could say that it was a very ad hoc um, way of kind of looking at how to get to to the data set. Um, there was like some machine learning, some language technology, some statistical methods. Uh, um, not not serious in uh, in uh, research wise, but um, but it worked. So there's some, um, some actual um, computer scientists who are now looking at you know, how to do it better. So, um, so this was obviously just the start. So we built this um, user interface, which is now available online. And you can, you can type in keywords, and then you can get to the discussions where people talk about those medications. So obviously, it's a, it's a prototype. And, uh, I haven't been able to continue this work, but it, it, there's a lot that could be done to make it better, uh, to add new functionalities and, and develop it further. So, uh, so what, we, what we had in the end, we had 1,500 uh, so-called keywords on drugs and medicine. And then uh, we added in the process also how they were correlated with certain symptoms and sensations and what the dosages of, uh, of the uh, medications were that people were talking about. So when you, when you search this, uh, this um, user interface, you can't search anything. The keyword has to be already there. So, um, so this is how it looks like. So this is a um, um, widely used uh, headache medicine. So you can see that, okay, the dosages that people talk about, they are the dosages in the medications that people, talk, people can, can buy from the pharmacy. And it's related to symptoms like toothache, menstrual pain, backache, uh, nerve, nerve, nerve pain. So then when I was uh, playing with this, I started thinking, well, first of all, you know, um, I was very disappointed when we had we had built this, people didn't use it. It was as if people didn't know what to do with it. So then I thought, okay, I have to show that you actually can do something with it. And I started playing with and looking around like, okay, so which discussions might be interesting to, to focus a bit more. And I wanted it to be something that people talk about uh, quite a lot or medications that people use quite a, quite a lot. So I started looking at antidepressants. 7% of Finns use them yearly. And this is, this is pretty much the norm in Western countries. 
and uh, and when you start looking at the discussions you know the first thing that you you start thinking about is that okay so antidepressants are not very um, competent in a sense that there are major uncertainties first of all how depression is diagnosed even though these medication discussions they don't necessarily talk about the depression per se but they talk about uh, antidepressants and then when i started looking at um, actual research there are also not only in how people talk about these things but also in actual research there are major uh, uncertainties in terms of how these uh, drugs are developed tested and prescribed so so you could say that the poor efficacy and um, sorry uh, and the side effects are an established feature of antidepressants rather than an anomaly so I looked at the antidepressant discussions in general, and those were not so interesting because they, they were kind of ranting about antidepressants um, on a general level, you know, often talking about how, uh, how um, pharmaceutical industry is this and that. And, and so it was kind of like, okay, so this is, this is kind of this critical debate that we know already. Then I started looking at individual drugs and that was kind of a turning point in terms of the research design, because when you look at comments that name a certain antidepressants, you get very close to first person experiences. So people are either asking for advice or they're giving advice. They're describing personal drug encounters or offering others advice, encouragement based on those personal experiences. So the general discussion moves to a very personal discussion. So then I started looking at, um, with the help of uh, two research assistants, we, we looked at um, three med medications of which this Remoror and, and Mirtazapina are actually the same, same medicine. Um, Remoror was first and then came Mirtazapina and then this Venla vaccine. And we started looking at the comments and what is said about these drugs and kind of uh, comparing between them. And the interesting thing was that if there was uh, a side effect, like people gain weight, then we would actually get stories of people complaining about gaining weight. Or if they said that they are, you know, uh, there are losses of sexual desire, uh, the side effects of the drugs said the same. So, so you, you, uh, you start seeing kind of this side effect, um, side effect uh, driven discussion, which has a, a foundation in the way these, these uh, drugs work. So this is how they, uh, they look like, you know, when you, when you look at the discussions and, uh, and this is where we actually, where we need uh, the machine learning. The machine learning is needed for handling the linguistic variation because when, when uh, people talk about these drugs, they use nicknames and they use very many different ways of writing. They uh, misspell the names, etc. So the interesting thing is that um, a lot of um, studies that talk about people's uh, experiences with medications, they are interview based or narrative based. But what this medicine radar does, it actually breaks the human driven logic of conversation because it takes those posts that mention the, mention the drug and that they don't care about how these posts are related to each other. So what it does, it opens a view to how these medications, what kinds of agencies these medications have. And, uh, and the interesting thing was that when I was reading the material, I started thinking about Jane Bennett's book, I will introduce it in a bit, this kind of new materialist study of, uh, of human machine or human um, thing entanglements, how people work together with, with material things. So this kind of thing power. So based on these stories, these medications, they actually had power over these people's bodies. They had pill power. And this is, this is the book. This is um, Jane Bennett's um, Vibrant Matter. Um, the political ecology of things, which I had always liked this book quite a bit, but I, I never knew what to do with it. So, so, um, so reading this material kind of invited, because it was saying that these medications, they are vibrant matter. 
So, um, so you, you started kind of seeing that, okay, here is something that, uh, where you can really talk about, talk about thing power, which curiously has not been talked that much about in, uh, in the realm of, uh, of studies in, within this kind of new material, um, um, what is it called? New material list studies. So Jane Bennett, uh, what, what, what her book does, it kind of offers a perspective to less certain and vibrant aspects of antidepressant encounters. It becomes very close to the bodies, like these snippets of texts that, uh, that the medicine radar finds, you know, they have, they are, they're very kind of bodily, bodily um, the, the stories. And it recognizes that there are efficiencies and inefficiencies in medical encounters. So, so these, these snippets were not only rants about how, um, how medications are, are bad for people, but people were also really praising uh, the effects of medications. So they were both. So they were, they, were, they were kind of like saying that, okay, for me, this worked fantastically. And then there were others for whom it didn't work at all. Um, one of the things that I started thinking immediately was that why do we actually talk about side effects? Because where is the side of the bodies where you can put these put these uh, effects of these these drugs? So even though the un unintended effects are listed as side effects, but the effects of drugs are actually always lived, whether they are intended or unintended. So if one becomes hungry, drowsy, has itching or sores loses sexual desires, they're, they're really much life effects rather than, than side effects. Another thing that, um, that um, Bennett books all, Bennett's uh, book also um, kind of highlights is this difference between mechanical and emergent causality. Mechanical causality is when something works as intended. The drug does what it's supposed to do, for instance, but Antidepressants were very much um, kind of uh, emergent causality um, driven in a sense that the drug acts differently in different bodies. This is, this is actually where we would need quite a bit of precision medicine to understand which drugs work for, for certain bodies. And also uh, something that people talked about a lot was this, um, how, how differently the drug works within the same body. And then when you add to this that people take not only one drug at a time, but they actually take several drugs at the time, uh, you, you have quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of going in terms of causalities. So, um, so then when I started actually um, exploring and it, with very kind of, uh, um, traditional qualitative ways, which is also, you know, something that, that maybe if you would build another version of uh, medicine radar, you would also have kind of the next step there, that once you have found the different posts, then you could do some machine learning after you have your little data set, but we didn't have it. So we were basically just reading, reading the, the posts uh, over and again, and uh, and trying to understand what was going on, and I think the remarkable thing was that they didn't say things that had not been said before in qualitative studies. So there was there was no kind of entirely novel aspects to antidepressant encounters. There's fantastic story, fantastic research done on how antidepressants. Uh, affect people. But, but the interesting thing was that there's kind of different registers in which these encounters are discussed. So if you take a more science and technology studies driven approach, you're interested in how this kind of stabilizing of antidepressant encounters happens. So there you might be talking about how people are tinkering with uh, with medications, you know, trying to get the dosage right. Um, how um, how the material surroundings in your home, for instance, are part of your uh, antidepressant experience. So you're kind of looking at these these 
various kinds of entanglements around antidepressants. And that was in the material that we were looking at too. Then there's the more kind of phenomenological approach, like you, you basically you're observing what the pill is doing to you. And this is more uh, within the tradition of phenomenolo ph phenomenology that you're looking at, okay, so, so what kind of life effects this drug actually has and how do I, how do I deal with them or how they are kind of, you know, something that you can't even, you know, you can't even talk about. It's just something that you feel and, and something that uh, has effects on your life. And then the third area is kind of like the narrative of me and my, uh, my antidepressants, where you are somehow coming to terms with, okay, this is the kind of agent that I'm dealing with and you are, you're kind of weaving your own narrative around it. Um, you might, in the end of the narrative, you might find a kind of, um, kind of a piece, okay, so I'm gonna be an antidepressant user for the rest of my life, but you know, that's how it is. And, uh, or the narrative becomes so difficult that you can't find a piece and you're basically just like, like uh, you go to your um, different directions. So what this basically says, you know, of course, I, I, all through this research, I'm also very interested in what does big data do to qualitative research? And the interesting thing here is that even though we had this huge data set, it didn't uncover novel aspects of everyday medicinal encounters, but it offers them collective weight. It actually says that, yes, this one has this experience and this one has this experience. So, so it, when, if, whether in uh, qualitative research, we have a group of 20 stabilizing antidepressants encounters, we have 10 people observing life effects, we have uh, 30 people coming to terms with life effects, this big data can say that, yes, they are there in you know, hundreds and in thousands. So uh, we should actually pay attention to these experiences. So what it does, it pushes us to see more clearly collectively shared features of human and antidepressant experience. So, it, so actually the radar, it participates in the research design by promoting a mode of observation that locates first person accounts by tracing the drug. Don Nafus has, uh, has uh, talked about this as, as a end of many ones uh, type of uh, research. So you kind of have this view to a multi-first person landscape that, you know, there's one and there's another one and they all have uh, end of one experiences, but they, they actually have something in common. So here steps the kind of the, uh, the Me Too in. And, uh, and so what Me Too com campaign, you know, tried to do originally, then I would say that once it actually became a com campaign, it started much more to, to remind this uh, viral example, which uh, would be another kind of uh, social media story. So, um, so viral examples, I'm, I'll give you a couple of uh, e examples in a bit. They're kind of these model stories that circulate very easily in social media. And the important thing is there is that they're individualistic and they don't kind of, uh, they don't refer to a structure that would kind of make that one person story understandable in terms of collective or structural issues. But what Me Too type of, uh, type of, uh, story does, it points to a structure. I have an experience, I have an experience, these two experiences are a little bit different, but they po point towards a uh, common structure. So uh, viral exemplums, according Maria Mäkelä, who has, uh, who has studied them, this in Finland, you know, illness as a heroic journey is, for instance, is a story that circulates uh, very nicely online, but also in the media. Brain cancer, taught me healthy selfishness. Well, when you look at these antidepressant posts, there's nothing heroic about them. You know, maybe somebody tries to be a little bit heroic when they, when they are in the kind of, uh, when they are in the narrative mode and telling afterwards their story. But most of these posts are, are, are kind of 
trying to understand what is going on with this with this capricious and, and weird medicinal agent that is so uh, difficult to to uh, to master and does kind of uh, odd things and and works or doesn't work. Another one is this Good Samaritan, but we don't need to go into that. So, so the Me Too structure, it mobilizes uh, first-person experiences. So the radar can offer a view to these Me Too experiences, but importantly, uh, they have not become a campaign when this kind of campaign mode starts to, starts to, uh, starts to kind of shape the story uh, structure in a way that, uh, that it, the kind of the original Me Too kind of uh, disappears. So these are me too experiences that that don't have this kind of uh, power of, uh, of, uh, of the me too campaign stories because it's kind of like okay so so um, I'm handling this situation like now this and I'm handling this situation like that there's there's not enough campaign material you know, in a sense so uh, so here we are kind of in this multi first person landscape where the qualitative and quantitative come together end of many ones and it calls for seeing beyond the individual so it starts to give form to these felt life effects of antidepressants and and ultimately it starts to raise more general questions about medicinal agencies and how they should be dealt with uh, collectively and what bennett is pushing for is what, she, what she's basically saying is that when you focus on these material agencies, you also pull them into the domain of politics. So if you would start politicizing life effects, and of course they have been done, of course the normalization of antidepressants in terms of mental health care has been an issue and has been discussed. But this is, this is kind of another way of doing it, showing that, okay, you can also think about it from these first person uh, person experiences where this where the where this kind of emergent causality is obviously a, a problem so the first crucial step in this uh, in this direction is taken with this material when the pill powers of antidepressants are collectively acknowledged and when i was uh, when i was uh, writing the paper that i was referencing there for social social uh, science and medicine I was also thinking about uh, if, if it, you know, if it's not kind of dramatic enough to think about the bodies of people, we might also think about what happens to these these antidepressants after they leave our bodies. The, the fishes that are exposed to these antidepressants then become more bold, uh, and 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 uh, shellfishes that spend more time in light light compared to animals not given drugs, meaning that they become um, easily um, prey for predators. So, um, so more mechanical causality uh, in today's language precision is obviously needed. So the normalization of long-term antidepressants use has consequences for the depressed, obviously, or you would say that antidepressants are also prescribed to many things that actually are not depression. They are also used for panic attacks, attacks or, or menopause symptoms of chronic pain. That um, non-humans, uh, but also you also the non-humans that we live with. So what Bennett, Bennett is saying is that we have to kind of call for uh, transforming modes of consumption into their opposite. And in this material, what was also very um, very kind of uh, obvious was that um, a lot of um, a lot of the people were actually saying that you can get antidepressants really easily, but you can't get other kinds of treatments. So antidepressants is kind of the go-to that you you have access to, but you can't have access to other kind of care. So in terms of um, antidepressants, with kind of less trial and error in terms of the, the use, their overall consumption would not only decrease, but you could would, would, you would also you know, have uh, less of these unintended uh, life effects. So um, the machine, the Me Too machines, what it actually does is, we often talk about patterns when we talk about uh, 
big data. But here we are actually, we are finding experiential patterns that also should be acknowledged. So I got this, uh, this email after, this, uh, after the social science and medicine paper was uh, published. And I thought it was very interesting because, because, okay, so such a valuable paper, it begins filling scientific and medical gaps and it sheds light over to uh, sheds overdue light on the reality of what at least 10 million, tens of millions of people now live in. I am one of them. So basically that one also saw that my story is also part of this universe of these tens of millions of stories. Similar things could, could be done uh, with other things. I have been uh, hoping that I would do a similar exercise with asthma. So the work continues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're opening now the floor for a discussion and for questions. So please, you can open your microphones and ask questions. And if you don't, I have plenty of questions to ask. I have a question to say. Yes. Uh, do you have or can you hire people in Klaalit that are trained in uh, precision medicine? are going through records and uh, to provide the uh, prediction and then can you contact the uh, are you contacting the patient yes so uh, we, we can do it and and we are doing that uh, however you should always remember that there's a lot of a uh, kind of legal and moral questions related to the using of what is called secondary data think about the Israel and Pfizer story from the last days. So basically, you know, all of the patients in Khalid, which I am one of them, never provide us any uh, agreement to use their data. So we, we do it under regulation with a lot of rules and IRBs, Helsinki's slash uh, committees, but we can, we are doing so. I can, and we do it very carefully. I can give you, provide you one example, which we really did and was really successful. So one of them, I think that you know that everyone above 50 is supposed to have a, either colonoscopy or an occult blood test uh, in stool. And uh, some people do it and some people never go and do this procedure. And we, we were able to make a prediction and to detect which people are in higher risk to have uh, the colon cancer. And what we did, we didn't take all of the patients. We just looked at clinic patients over the age of 50, that we are supposed to do the occult blood test and never did, did so. So we didn't took any, any further risk. We didn't invent you know, the medicine from the beginning, but we really concentrated on those uh, people and say, you know, we were supposed to do occult blood test and we told the physician actually, we electronically provided information to the physician and told them, please call those patients and let them know that they really should do the test they'd better do it and not just say, okay, it's another recommendation. So we do it all the time in many, many fields. Thank you. Mina, can you update us on where the project is standing now? And is there, for example, a, a reference to COVID-19 as well in Finland? Yeah, so um, it's, it's nowhere. Unfortunately, this project is, uh, is is it's too weird i think for um for the company to continue with it so everybody thought it was a great success but then going forward it would require that we do it in a much more rigorous way and we start like kind of really working with it and i haven't been able to to get the team together so um and then unfortunately i got i got research funding for other kinds of projects so um fearing that this, this part of my work will kind of uh, not continue. So, um, so of course there's, there's other kinds of digital health initiatives also in terms of uh, COVID-19. And I think one of the most successful has been um, kind of digital health um, symptom checker uh, kind of thing where people can check their symptoms themselves and then they can communicate to the healthcare uh, service. So. So that kind of thing, but unfortunately, nothing with medicine radar. 
Shai, you mentioned the biobanking at the beginning. Can you tell us a bit about the biobanking that you're leading and where it stands? Uh, yes, and I will start and say that this is an, on its beginning, which is un unfortunate because as we all could see in the COVID-19, biobanking has huge advances. So if you think about all of those papers in science, they detected genetic risk factors for uh, COVID-19. Almost in all of them, the UK Biobank, which is the best and the most, uh, oldest and most established biobank in the world, it was involved. Because what they did, because they've got information, for genetic information regarding 500,000 people, they just could find those people from this bank that had COVID-19 infection and very easily, immediately, could look at the genomic data and look at the differences. And this is the ultimate goal of any biobank. So we really just started to uh, recruit patients lately in the last uh, couple of months. However, we, we do have the advantage of, uh, of our EMR, of the electronic medical records, uh, in difference of most of the other biobanks. So UK Biobank, for example, did not, could not get handled all of the medical records. What they did, they invited people to the centers, you know, they asked many questionnaires, they did a physical test, they did uh, many other tests. But this is not like having medical uh, records because if someone will ask me, you know, Shai, wh what kind of medication did you get for your pharyngitis five years ago? I have no, I, I don't even have a clue that I had pharyngitis five years ago. So we, we do it much slower. It uh, really requires a lot of effort and a lot of uh, budget, which in Israel is not available. Now with the COVID, it won't be available soon. So we do it with partners. But we are start building it, and from the very beginning, you know, whenever whatever information we've got, we can immediately connect it to the email. But can you tell us what is the goal? How many people spread in the population? What samples yeah. are you going to collect? Yeah, yeah, I will. So the goal is to so first of all, as I say, there's many kinds of omics, but we will start with genetic data, just genomic data, just because this is the, the one data, as Noam knows very good, that we've got the most of the information about and we can, do, it is more practical one and very easy to collect. Uh, then we plan to do it from the general population. So it's not a biobank of uh, people with a certain specific disorders, but just from the general population, uh, understanding that the general populations, uh, people there have many, many different disorders and uh, of course, it makes sense to take it from all the population because they've got more disease and we know more, we've got more information about them. We, we aim to start with about 80,000 uh, people, but you know, the ultimate goal for us is not adding biobank, it's adding genomic, genomic information about any member in, at Klalit or in Israel. So this is the ultimate goal. So you would like that everyone when it turns 18, because I don't want to talk about uh, people younger than that, will have genetic testing. You know, this kind of testing can provide information about the risk for uh, autosomal dominant disorders like cancer, of being carrier of disorders, of polygenic risk scores. So it's huge information. And nowadays it's not so expensive, but still having 4 million people and doing those tests, it's really, really expensive overall. But I'm sure that in I don't know, I don't want to predict because we don't, can say nothing, but I guess that in what, 10, 15 years, I would like to hear your opinion. Everyone in the Western world will have his own uh, genome data on end co connected to his email. Well, it's not a technical issue anymore. It's an ethical issue now. So I don't know how much uh, the standard uh, non-diseased individuals would agree to having the entire DNA read. Maybe if you can chop it up to small pieces and tell them specific information about specific diseases, it would be easier to digest the information. I'm in favor, obviously, but I don't know. You have access, obviously, to patients and to 55% uh, uh, of uh, the patients in Israel. Uh, maybe you can, uh, maybe you know better how compliant people are to sequence their DNA. Okay. So actually we know from the biobank, from the research, that people are very compliant. Uh, however, I think that nowadays, because of the COVID, people really do collaborate with medical effort. I don't know if it's going to stay like that, you know, in the couple of coming months or, or after that. Uh, and you know, because it's research, we always ask the people, would you like to get back genetic information or not if you find something? 
And actually everyone that take part of this biobank say, I would like to. Probably if they don't, they wouldn't like to be part of the biobank. But people are eager to know this information. Actually, they, my feeling is that people not always know what they sign. You know, we try to explain and people say, don't explain, it's fine. Let me just sign. And I say, no, no, you, you need to know the fact. And I think that we have a system we need to protect the people from having too much knowledge about the data, having not some, and we always look only for what we call actionable genes. So we don't provide any information that cannot provide immediately very clear uh, benefit to the individual if he knows it. And this is the idea, but it's still complicated. You know, now in Israel, as some of you know, every woman that is origin is Ashkenazi, full or partially, and she is over 18, she can ask for screening for the common BRCA1 and 2 mutations, the one associated with the breast cancer. And there is no genetic counseling before of that. And we provide uh, movies and clips and information. But, but I'm not sure, but I'm sure that some women will do that, will get the result, and they say, oh my gosh, I didn't want to know that. Why did you let, tell me that I need this and this follow up, that I, it will be better for me to get rid of my ovaries when I'm 14 and so on? So it's a really complex story. But with time, I think genomic will become, become part of the world and everything will be, will be easier. I agree. We have to get used to the fact that everybody has mutations and everybody is a carrier. We just know, have to know what it is and be cautious later on in our life. Exactly. Mina, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned following antidepressants and you talked about percentage in the population. Can you see a trend, for example, throughout the seasons, winter versus summer? A tough times versus easier times. Can you predict um, the population uh, uh, um, response to the environment, the weather, and what goes on around? We actually uh, did another st study where we looked at this data um, in terms of emotional trends. And what we discovered was that people were happier in the summer and not so happy in the winter. So, so I guess that's your, that's your answer. So um, yeah, and those kinds of studies you can, you can do easily with this, uh, this kind of data set that you look at trends of, of, of things. But then uh, to me, it's kind of like, okay, so um, these trends might just be stating the obvious. So um, so not necessarily such an interesting approach to, to big data. Oh, I would say it's a positive control. You yes. expect it to happen and you see it happening. Well, that's the, that's the thing that you can kind of uh, um, prove uh, commonsensical things with this kind of data set. Uh, I actually have a comment on, on regarding Mina's talk. And actually, we would like to have all of those kind of data about what people feel and what people think and how they think. The only thing that you imagine is that for machines, any numbers like lab results, it is easier than having uh, such data. However, we try to do it as much as we can. Uh, I know that you know in the clinic, we've got a problem of no show. And we've got it in all the medical systems that people have an appointment, but ne and you, you, you check it with the phone and say, of course I will come or by sending them a text and say, I will come, no problem. And they don't come. And, the, and this generated problem because at that time we could get an other people to get to the clinic, of course. And now we've got long lines of people that don't uh, attend. And actually what we, we did, we did this, this actually with, uh, with people from the behavioral economics field. We really try to understand what people think, why they don't come, uh, what will motivate them to come. And actually we ended to spend a personalized uh, SMS text, uh, texting, based on what we know about the people. So, you know, if some, there is someone 70 year old and you ask him to come and say, you know, I'm old, why should I come? But if you say, you know, your grandkids really would like to see you around many years, they, they will come, you know, it's funny, but it really works. So, so when I talk about multi liars the information, the kind of information uh, Mina talked about is absolutely relevant. The only question is how can we dig it? How can we get it? Yes. And, uh, and I, I really like the no-show example because it's, it's, it's a really good way of also looking at, you know, um, how services respond to what people do. So you look at it from the perspective of, uh, of the service, because some of the things is that we sometimes we think that big data needs to be about uh, 
personal data in a sense of uh, personal data. But what I like about the medicine radar is that we don't need to know who these people are necessarily. We don't need to know with no-shows, we don't need to know the personal characteristics, but we can do some sort of estimates. And like you said, and then we can, you know, we can build kind of these, these profiles. And if we can respond to those profiles in a way that aligns with their experiences, then you are more likely to get a good effect. So um, yeah, so, so I completely believe that the, with this kind of uh, experiential data, uh, you, you can get to really interesting things because it's unsolicited data, which also makes it difficult to, to, to work with. But the fact that these people were talking about antidepressants when nobody asked them to talk about them. So it's, there's not an interviewee who says that, you know, try to remember it, what your antidepressant encounter was like, but they're writing when it's actually happening, when the situation is, is on, so to speak. So then you get into this kind of phenomenological views that you would, you would not get otherwise. So in that sense, I believe that, um, that social media data can be very valuable, but you just have to think very carefully how you use it because, uh, because you know, a lot of the data is when you read these, these, um, these posts, they just feel that there's nothing there. So you have to have a big enough data set and then condense something out of there and then it becomes valuable. Israelis are usually so talkative. <laughs> Where are all the, you know, the provoked questions? Everybody's out in the to... sun. Everybody's out in the sun. It's a sunny day outside. Oh, really? No. We have a it... snowstorm. Snow <laughs> no, we always have sun. It, I'm sure people are still inside. Yeah. Um, okay, other questions? If not, I'm going to keep on asking. Mina, you said you have several uh, digital uh, medicine uh, projects now. Can you tell us about uh, one of them, please? Yeah, well, one of them is we're looking at this digital symptom checker, um, what it does, and, and that's a kind of a new, new, new kind of way of, uh, of dealing with people's symptoms. So that's one, but I, I, it's in, in the beginning, it's part of this rehumanizing automated decision-making project that we have. And the aim of that is to look at uh, when you build this kind of uh, systems, where you try to automatize part, parts of uh, interaction, um, how do you keep the human involved in the process? And what does it actually mean to, to build this kind of complex uh, socio-technical systems? Because they, they're not only technologies, they're also, you know, um, they're also designing uh, how we see ourselves and others, and which also, you know, goes to this kind of genomics field that you know it, genomics is a very socio-technical thing and that's why it's 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 very complex because uh, people treat their personal data in in very different ways for instance you know when people learn about risks for instance they have very different ways ways of reacting to those so some people are completely paralyzed and other people are like well you know um, um, that's life so I, I'll, I actually did a study, so I can tell you a little anecdote. Uh, there was a, um, an older man who had a, a gout risk and he actually had gout based on 23andMe results. And then I asked him that, you know, um, if you had known that you have this gout risks, risk, would you have changed something in your life? For instance, you know, would you have, uh, would you have drank less beer because he was an avid beer drinker and he was very sad that he couldn't drink beer anymore because of his gout and he looked at me and he said I would have drank every single bottle the same so so I think that's that's um that everything happens kind of in in different kinds of contexts and and that's why uh the digital health field is is fascinating but also demanding I agree, and I think there were uh, surveys showing that people would not change their lifestyle based on gen genetics. They would have been maybe in a shock for a few weeks, but that's it. Most people will return to their own lifestyles. Yeah. 
Shai, can you give us a cool example? You mentioned AI and, and you talked quite a lot at the beginning about uh, artificial intelligence. Can you give us an example of how Clalit takes that into account uh, medically on a clinical uh, level? Yeah, yes, uh, I can provide a few examples. Uh, I think that maybe the best one would be, I will talk about the corona because it's relevant for all of us. So in the corona, we, we were able to generate a few relevant tools. I was talking a, bit, a little bit about one of them, and I'll talk about the other one. The one I mentioned at the beginning was our uh, ability, uh, again, to, to know who has high risk uh, for, uh, for complications, and it really affected the policy. The other one uh, was a few months ago, if you remember the Israeli one of you, that there was a time there were many sick people, but there were no, not enough tests. Now this is not the situation in Israel. In Israel there are so many tests now, it's almost uh, unbelievable. And uh, actually everyone can go and do a test, either by his HMO or just go you know, to the nearest uh, square in the city and, uh, and uh, the test. But at that time there was no, no test. And what we could do, uh, we could uh, predict ahead of time about everyone, what is his risk to have a positive test uh, at the same day. Some of them was related on demographic data, what happened in your uh, neighborhood, which is really important, but it was re related to the question, you know, wh uh, what is your uh, sex? What is your age? Where do you walk? And then when you've got, you know, that some people are in higher risk, then you could, uh, you know that they need the, uh, the test more than others. And what we did, there is a, another kind of, we always talk about the PCR testing that takes a few hours, but actually if, if some of you and probably, yeah, as the answer is yes, did PCR lately, you can wait between one day to almost four days before you get uh, the results. You can think that every day it's like, I don't know, it's 1% uh, of the Israeli population doing PCR daily. This, those are the numbers today, even 1.5. So what, there, there is another kind of test which are the, the antigen tests, which provide you a result in 10 or 20 minutes. And, the, and this is really important because as all we know, we, we try to break actually the, the, the infection chain. So let's say that I did the test, but I'm not in isolation, I'm not in quarantine. Then I did the test, but I'm still going to work, I can infect other people and so on. But some people have such a risk, even if they don't have symptoms, that you would like to catch them uh, earlier. So we were able to, to find those people that having a higher risk and asking, you know, you have higher risk, just do, do the fast antigen test and you will get the results in 20 minutes. The, the result is not as accurate as the PCR, which is a gold standard nowadays, why it's not so accurate. However, when if some people had a higher risk and they did the test and it was positive, he knew that it should go on and they should wait to the PCR and be in quarantine and not keep infecting uh, other people. So really, it, it makes a difference. You know, it's AI, in, you know, it's not enough. Apparently it was detected that those antigen tests are not accurate en enough. So we had really problems that, you know, people with a uh, positive test actually were found to, to be negative. And meanwhile, they were in Corona department and they could get, get Corona just by the exposure. But, so this is a tool that never works by itself, but it can combine with all of the other tools that we can find. Now, actually, there are, are better direct antigen testing. They are much more available and, and accurate. But now, for this moment, we've got PCR. So those are two examples that uh, we were really were able to, to use the data. And the other thing that we do, it's not AI, but it's data. Of course, we really, not only us, if the state of Israel, really would get a very good information about people that get vaccination and did PCR and were positive or negative. So what is the real world infection rate of, uh, of COVID after vaccination? I'm sure this uh, news will come from Israel and you should expect many new in the Journal of Medicine papers coming with knowledge important to all of the world because Israel is really a very big lab with a lot of uh, digitalization. Do you have a number for us about infections after vaccinations? You know, it's really, really easy. So I'm, I'm the first one at Kralit which had vaccination. So I had my second one two days ago. My arm is still aching. Uh, so we really started to gather information. 
but it seems that the information provided by Pfizer is correct. If you remember the famous graph, they showed that uh, starting after 12 days after the first uh, shot, uh, it will be, you, you start see separation between the people vaccinated and not vaccinated. And actually, if you think about it, about medicine and science and just common knowledge, so in, in the UK, as we all know, uh, they decided to provide only one, one vaccine and to wait three months say, before they provide the, actually even more, to up to 12 weeks before they provided the second one. There is no any medical data that support or doesn't support uh, their uh, knowledge or, or their policy. We will be able to provide it to some degree because after three weeks, everyone is able to get the second uh, vaccine shot, but we'll be able to, to know how effective is one, uh, one shot between, two, between 12 days and 21 days. So it, it looks good from the beginning, but it's really the beginning and each day uh, we have more information and uh, we get it every Sunday. So now you're welcome to call me with the very fresh secret news. Yeah, I prefer the Israeli experiment than the UK experiment. And uh, we're out of time now. So I want to thank everybody. And I think I can summarize it in one word, data. Okay, it could be different types of data, clinical data, it could be data that you can collect online, data of blogs and discussions. If we know how to manage the data well enough, I think we will be able to help uh, medicine and uh, biotech and pharma companies could really drive in the right direction and HMOs, uh, of course. And we're all participating in this huge experiment since the beginning of uh, 2020. And we hope that this experiment will be over very soon in 2021. Thank you very much. But thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. It bye. was very interesting. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Mina, can you stay online for a minute?